The date is Tuesday, August 20. This is the news on PBCJ. I am Simone Absalom. The Ministry of Health says Jamaica recorded more than 140 suspected cases of dengue fever last month and attributed this to spike in prevailing drought conditions. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jacqueline Bessessa McKenzie, speaking to the media on Monday, said this was significantly higher than the number recorded in July last year. She revealed that the number of suspected dengue cases recorded for three out of the last five years have been above the monthly mean. She said the ministry was receiving more notifications even during the usual lull period, explaining that the heat has caused an increase in mosquito population. Dr. Bessessa added that more persons are storing water in containers and this has created additional mosquito breeding sites. Opposition spokesperson on education, Ronald Thwaites, is calling for a clear funding plan for schools where parents are unable to pay auxiliary fees. Thwaites said at a People's National Party press conference yesterday, If the contributions by parents which schools need are to be abolished, then the government must now, not in the future, provide the additional money so that schools can maintain the highest levels of performance, offer the highest levels of education without calling upon external groups such as parents to provide. His comments came after Junior Education Minister Orlando Terrellong's Sunday statement, speaking of impending changes to the funding formula for public high schools in light of discord over auxiliary fees charged by schools. Both the Prime Minister and one of the three ministers in education have been reiterating that auxiliary fees have been abolished. Every single child at every element and stage of education has got a voucher to pay. How can you be asked to pay what you say has been abolished? That is a contradiction. Thwaites said that while he agreed with the move, the ministry should act now. He said funding at two schools should be based on need. 13 students received back-to-school grants from the Ministry of Labor and Social Security at a press conference Friday at the ministry's head office in Kingston. Students are among 162,654 children on the Program of Advancement Through Health and Education path who will benefit from the financial assistance, with each student set to receive $3,500 during the month of August. At the press conference, Labour Minister Shahini Robinson stressed that the ministry had a mandate to assist the needy. The Ministry of Labour and Social Security in September 2018 introduced the Back to School Grant for PATH beneficiaries. This benefit is payable to all registered PATH students attending primary and secondary schools island-wide. The total amount that will be disbursed in the Back to School initiative is $569.3 million. Students are invited to attend the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information's two tertiary and employment fairs on Thursday, August 22 and Friday, August 23. The first at the Campion College Auditorium in Kingston and the second at St. Hilda's Diocesan High School Auditorium in St. Anne. National Mathematics Coordinator in the Ministry, Dr. Tamika Benjamin, said the focus of the fairs is to provide an opportunity for students who have recently received their Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate and Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination results to enroll in tertiary institutions or find employment. The Jamaica Teachers Association, JTA, has recovered some of the funds that were stolen from it by a former employee. For more than six years, the Jamaica Teachers Association has been battling to recover the money defrauded by its former accounts clerk, Marlon Francis. Francis and his cronies defrauded the association of more than $95 million. The discovery was made in 2013. 
At the JTA's annual general meeting in Montego Bay, St. James on Monday, the association's leadership reported that last year it recovered three properties valued at almost $40 million. One of the properties, located in Chancery Hall, St. Andrew, valued at $25 million. With the government set to implement the Tourism Workers Pension Scheme in 2020, regulations are being prepared to support the scheme. The Tourism Workers Pension Act 2019 was passed in the House of Representatives and the Senate recently. The Financial Services Commission will be responsible for regulatory oversight of the scheme. In accordance with the provisions of the Tourism Workers Pension Act, the Pensions Superannuation Funds and Retirement Schemes Act, and the Financial Services Commission Act. Permanent Secretary in the Tourism Ministry, Jennifer Griffith, spoke to the groundwork regulation being undertaken. We are well advanced in the actual work and we expect to complete that soon. The next area, of course, will be procurement of the fund manager and the fund administrator. Somebody has to manage the overall scheme, make sure the funds are collected, make sure they're paid over properly, make sure that um, uh, members are properly informed and all of that. So the administrative functions uh, will procure for a fund manager for that aspect and will also procure for a fund manager or investment manager. The scheme is one component of a three-pronged human capital development plan for industry workers, which includes training and capacity building. The Permanent Secretary also spoke to the education campaign now underway to sensitize the public. We have already started a public, public awareness campaign. You would have heard it on the various airwaves. We have flyers, we have been having town hall meetings. We have been having social media exposés and will continue with all of this. Ms. Griffith was speaking at a JIS think tank session last Friday in Kingston. Hundreds of cameras have been installed across the island by the government in keeping with proposed electronic surveillance system to help reduce traffic violations. That's according to Minister of Transport and Mining Robert Montague. Minister Montague says Cabinet has passed the framework and approximately 490 traffic cameras have been installed across Kingston, 80 in Ocho Rios, 120 in Montego Bay, 38 in Maypen and 30 in Mandeville. These state-of-the-art systems have license plate reading technology which are geared towards recording vehicles involved in traffic offences. In a ministry paper tabled in Parliament last month, Cabinet explained that under the proposed system, unmanned electronic devices will be used to capture violations. One of the island's top plastic surgeons is advocating the establishment of a specialist registry in light of a significant increase in demand for plastic surgeries across the island. Senior plastic surgeon at the University Hospital of the West Indies, Dr. Guyane Arscott, also wants the government to format legislation that would facilitate this registry, something he says the Jamaica Medical Council has been working on now for some time. Arscott told reporters that legislation to decide who can perform this procedure does not exist. Body contour surgery, Arscott says, includes surgery on the breast, liposuction of the stomach, back, buttocks and thighs, among other areas. The U.S. dollar on Monday, August 19 ended trading at Jamaican $135.55, down by 5 cents. And that's according to the Bank of Jamaica's daily foreign exchange trading summary. The Canadian dollar ended trading at Jamaican $103.07, up from $102.29 while the British pound sterling ended trading at Jamaican $164.06, up from $163.80. In regional news, the recently formed A New and United Guyana political party says it supports the idea of extending the deadline for holding fresh regional and general elections. But the party said it would only support the move if the elections are held this year. This from party's General Secretary Ralph Ramkaran. We believe that the leader of the opposition and the People's Progressive Party 
would be inclined to support an extension in the National Assembly, even though they have not yet said so officially. So, it is hoped, therefore, that this will be the outcome of the discussions in the Elections Commission and that we will have elections. Ram Karan also called on the Guyana Elections Commission, GCOM, to sort out the voters list promptly and advise President David Granger on a fresh date for Guyana to go to the polls. And let us hope that over the next few days, the Elections Commission, on which we are now relying, <clears throat> takes the correct position, <clears throat> and sorry, and X, and, and fixes, take, take the correct position, and utilizes the 2018 list, put it up for claims and objections, and they're able to advise the president that elections could be held soon. Only the elections now can bring back some form of stability to Guyana. In Trinidad and Tobago, leader of the opposition United National Congress, UNC Kamla Prasad Basesa, has raised questions about recently reinstated government senator Foster Cummings' connections to recently awarded state contracts. We have more in this report. She said three companies have received work from the government. Two of these firms, she says, belong to Senator Cummings and his wife, Cummings and Associates Company Limited and Pical Services Company Limited. HDC contracts are going to the company owned by Cummings and his wife, Pical Services Limited. You'll see the truck there, Pical Services. They're doing the work, and I want to ask the Prime Minister, if the same company, the same Foster Cummings Pical Company, was awarded contracts for garbage collection service in HDC developments. If you look she questioned the nature of the award of the contract. What was the procurement process used to hire General Secretary Foster? Was it selective tendering again? How much are these contracts worth? Why is it that PICAL is given, being given all this work by the HDC? What about the other smaller contractors with the equipment rusting away, rotting away, workers being fired, but you're giving the General Secretary all these contracts? at HDC. In sports, we put the spotlight on cricket. West Indies captain Jason Holder has retained his all-rounder top ranking ahead of Thursday's start of the two-test series against India in Antigua. The 27-year-old Barbadian topped all-rounders charts in test back in January following his stunning double hundred in the first test against England in Bridgetown that propelled the home side to a massive 381-run victory. Holder also picked two wickets in that match to move up two places to the top rung. He will lead West Indies in the opening test at Sir Vivian Richards Stadium where he will look to further solidify his status in the rankings. Holder is also the highest ranked West Indian in the bowling charts at number 8, having retained that spot while fellow bowler Kemar Roach has also retained his 11th place ranking. Speedster Shannon Gabriel is the other West Indies bowler at the top 20 at number 12. In the batting rankings, West Indies opener Craig Brathwaite is the highest ranked Caribbean player at 36th, while Holder popping up at 37th. India's captain Virat Kohli tops the charts with Australian Steve Smith having climbed one place to second spot. And New Zealand, Kane Williamson lying third. That's the news on PBCJ. Thanks so much for watching.